afternoon. Um, it is um, with great pleasure that we have Angela Comito come to give us a talk. Before I introduce her, I just want to mention that this, this talk by the Anthropology Department is one of the first this, this year, the, um, right after the Christmas break, there will be another set of talks on the 31st of January, um, where a number of the faculty members from the Anthropology Department who are archaeologists and a number of the, the people, the archaeologists working at the New York State Museum will be giving um, talks as well. So those of you that are interested in archaeology more generally, um, I encourage you to look for, for flyers and posters for that. So it's the 31st of, of January once, uh, once we're back from the Christmas break. All right. So now Angela um, is, a, uh, is a doctoral candidate in, uh, at the University of Michigan in the Art and Archaeology Department. And she's worked in Italy, uh, Turkey, and Georgia. Um, but her interests are actually, in some ways, surprisingly close to those of us in the anthropology department. Uh, and she does a, a lot of regional settlement survey, uses GIS, um, and does uh, paleobotanical analysis to reconstruct past environments uh, and, uh, and subsistence systems. She has a, a, a couple of publications, one out and one in press, uh, based on her research in the, the area of Albania and the Republic of Georgia, um, which is not what her dissertation is on. This is a, a whole other project. Um, and what she'll be speaking uh, to us today about, the title up there, is, is uh, work uh, predominantly from, from Turkey, but uh, it, based on her dissertation, which is more of a regional synthesis uh, of, of settlement patterns and, and adaptations across a larger area of Asia Minor. So, Without further delay, I will hand the floor over. Good afternoon. Before I begin, I'd like to thank Rob Rosenswick for inviting me to give this talk in the first place, and the Anthropology Department for sponsoring me here as a research associate uh, as I finish my dissertation, and also Stuart Swinney for this warm welcome into this community and for making this all possible in the first place. Now today I'm going to be reading from a script, which is not my usual style, it's a little more formal, but I'm putting some of these ideas together in a way that I haven't quite um, in the past, so for your benefit and mine, I think that's the way to go. So today I will be going to present, uh, going to present some aspects of my dissertation research, which examines the changes in Greco-Roman life that mark the end of antiquity in Asia Minor, roughly the area of modern Turkey. I aim to understand the end of antiquity in this region, that is its timing, nature, and causes, by looking beyond cities to the countryside, using regional survey and environmental archaeology, which are still relatively new methods in the archaeology of Turkey. Today my goal is to talk in broad strokes, first to outline the, the basic questions of my research, uh, my approach, and my goals, and then to explain some preliminary conclusions using, excuse me, a few examples as illustrations. So today I will be talking, oh, got my trigger happy there. Yeah. Today, today I'll be talking about Asia Minor in the Eastern Mediterranean during a time period extending from about 400 to 800 CE. Now I came to this time period and topic as an archeologist trained in a slightly, slightly earlier period that is, the first few centuries of the Common Era, when the stability and interaction provided by the Roman Empire nourished a network of prosperous towns and villages across the Mediterranean basin. By 700 CE, much of what had characterized Greco-Roman life, the vibrant cities packed with elaborate public monuments, the well-made and widely available goods, the basic expectations of security and material comfort, seem to have disappeared. To me, the end of antiquity is intriguing as both a time period and a process because it is full of unanswered questions, of conflicting evidence and high stakes interpretations. On the one hand, the changes of the 5th through 8th centuries seem to comprise an unwelcome process of reversal, whereby the long complex development of Greco Roman urbanization unraveled slowly in fits and starts. On the other hand, these changes might instead be viewed as a process of reconfiguration, 
that is of adaptation and resilience in response to altered circumstances. Which is the more accurate depiction? What's at the end of the Roman Empire and the end of Greco-Roman antiquity in general feel like for the generations who lived through it? What did this process of completion, of packing in, of wrapping up, look like? And why did it happen in the first place? Let me take a step back chronologically and provide a little bit of background information. As I said before, during the first few centuries of the Common Era, much of the Mediterranean region was at least nominally part of an empire with the city of Rome at its heart. And for the most part, this was a period of population growth, urbanism, and economic vitality. People and materials ranging from luxury items to staple foodstuffs like olive oil and grain crisscross this inland sea in international networks of bulk exchange and communication. In Asia Minor, many of the towns that had been around for centuries experienced a boom in this period. They grew larger in population. Their residents exploited natural resources such as water and marble to build Roman-style buildings like aqueducts and bath complexes. And they were plugged into a system of long-distance trade and exchange that made certain kinds of goods, like certain kinds of pottery, familiar and available to everyone across the Mediterranean. The countryside around these towns was cultivated by farmers living in villages or farmsteads, many of whom produced agricultural commodities and surplus to give as rent to a landlord, as tax to the state, or to sell in local and regional markets. I'll be talking about different scales of exchange in this talk, so let me explain what I mean by each. Local exchange is defined as a one-day transit time or within a radius of less than about 50 kilometers by land or the distance of one day sailing. Um, here you see a schematic representation of this level of exchange centered around the, the ancient city of Antioch in Syria. Local exchange is the most challenging level of exchange to discern. It operates largely via local production and, excuse me, local producers rather than professional traders and involves mainly daily staples like food and pottery, as well as raw materials and sources of energies. Regional exchange operates above this limit and below 10 days travel, and corresponds to a radius of about 100, 300 kilometers. It involves professional traders who similarly move pottery, food, raw materials, and sources of energy. The largest scale, interregional, connects two different regions that each have a radius of about 100 to 300. And the reason those bluish circles are, are double is that the smaller one is 100 um, and, the, and the larger one is a 300 kilometer radius. It is not necessarily long distance, this level of exchange, but most frequently so because <coughs> the two regions usually are not adjacent to each other. This means that exchange between northern Syria and Constantinople, for instance, which you see up there, is considered interregional, but so is the much longer distance between northern Syria and, say, France or Britain where indeed samples of pottery produced from northern Syria have been found. Obviously, the enormous difference in the cost between sea and land travel, sea being much easier and cheaper, distorts these simplified circles I've drawn. And we also have to remember that regional and interregional networks intermixed and overlapped. For a long time, it was assumed that the dynamism and prosperity of those first few centuries CE, what we all think of as the height of the Roman Empire, started to decline during the fourth century as the empire experienced political upheaval and the new imperial capital at Constantinople, modern Istanbul, came to eclipse Rome itself as the major seat of imperial power. By the sixth century, the city of Rome and much of what had been the Roman Empire in the West had been broken up into various Romano-Germanic kingdoms. But in the East, the Roman Empire was very much alive and kicking. From this period on, it is known as the Byzantine Empire, after the name Byzantion of the Greek colony founded in the 7th century BCE on the site of what later became Constantinople. But despite the fact that scholars use this different name, it was very much a continuation of the Roman Empire, and its citizens called themselves Romans. Archaeological evidence has shown that <coughs> far from being a period of economic and demographic stagnation or decline, late antiquity, so again I'm talking about this period from about 300 to 700 CP, or AD, was actually a period of unprecedented prosperity in much of the Eastern Mediterranean. 
This revised view has grown out of a number of ongoing developments in archaeology. One is the expansion of regional survey in rural landscapes, which has demonstrated that in many parts of the eastern Mediterranean, hundreds of villages like this one in northwest Syria were established across the countryside during this period, suggesting that late antiquity was in fact a period of growth and prosperity in both city and countryside. Another development comes from pottery studies. It is the realization that pottery and foodstuffs continue to circulate all around the Mediterranean in late antiquity. This regional and interregional exchange was particularly active in the East at this time, where networks of production and distribution seem to have been intensified to meet the demands of the new capital of Constantinople, the army along the eastern frontiers of the empire, and the many other hungry cities in the East. Of particular relevance for us was the identification of certain types of transport vessels called amphorae, and you see two examples up on the top left, which carried oil, wine, and other foodstuffs like fish sauce, as well as fine ceramics tablewares like the African red slip that you see down on the bottom left, um, all across the Mediterranean. For example, one of these amphora types, late Roman amphora type one, shown here, was carried all the way across the Mediterranean, even to places where the, where the Byzantine Empire no longer existed, like the British Isles. And you can see this map of fine spots of this one particular type of amphora, which um, uh, was in circulation until at least through the seventh century. That is, the Roman world system of bulk interregional exchange was still going strong in late antiquity. This means that a farmer living in the remote highlands of Asia Minor, for instance, might use the same kind of red slipped plates and bowls made in North Africa as a farmer living all the way across the Mediterranean in France, or a relatively well-to-do urbanite in Constantinople itself. It also means that olive oil, wine, and other commodities produced in farms and villages in Southeast Asia Minor, for instance, or in Palestine, ended up on tables as far flung as military forts along the Danube, here in Bulgaria, we use this, oh yeah, or townhouses in northern Italy. It was kind of an early form of mini globalization. So in giving you this background information, I have been setting the scene for what comes next in the course of the 6th and 7th centuries, because during this time something happens and many of the features of Greco-Roman life and society that had been around for centuries, as I've been describing them, fundamentally changed. The first change noted by scholars studying this period was the fate of the ancient Greco-Roman city itself. Cities and towns in the Eastern Mediterranean had fared well during late antiquity, but eventually they, like their counterparts in the West, became smaller in population and size as priorities shifted and civic life broke apart. In Asia Minor, evidence for the ruralization and depopulation of urban spaces suggests that by the 7th century, a new urban form had materialized, a smaller type of settlement, more rural, Christian, and concerned with security than its predecessor. But despite a long history of research, the heart of the problem remains as vexing as ever. How did this happen? Why was urban living no longer considered viable or desirable? And what happened next? The why of this historical problem remains unsolved, in part because there are so many plausible culprits in this time, including violent conflict with Sassanid Persian and then Muslim Arab forces, economic instability and political turmoil, social changes related to the rise of Christianity, devastating and recurring plague, and environmental factors including natural events such as earthquakes and climate deterioration, as well as human-induced events such as erosion and the over-exploitation of natural resources. This was a tough time to live. The when of that question is equally thorny because the identification of a tipping point between antiquity and the Middle Ages, of course, depends on the markers used to measure change, and therefore differs widely depending on which markers are used. For Asia Minor, because for decades, archeological research was concentrated on the excavation of monumental urban sites, the main marker used to measure change has typically been the ancient city, and therefore the tipping point has traditionally been placed in the early 7th century, when cities seem to contract or disappear. Accordingly, the city then has served as a proxy for antiquity overall, 
its survival signifying the continuity, and its disappearance, the end, of antiquity in general, followed by the start of a true dark age. Using the city as the main marker of change makes a lot of sense and has been an enormously fruitful approach. Vibrant urban life really was a hallmark of Greco-Roman antiquity, recognized by ancient authors and modern scholars alike. And until recently, a good part of the evidence, textual, epigraphic, numismatic, and archeological, for late antiquity and the early Byzantine period has come from cities, or if not from a city directly, some urban context of creation and discovery. But how can we expect to understand this period and address these problems without moving beyond cities and exploring the richly peopled landscapes in which they were embedded? If the goal is to understand the end of antiquity more generally, using this one single index of change will not suffice. Cities did not exist in isolation, but were inextricably linked to the suburbs and countryside surrounding them, where crops ripened, armies marched, families and communities flourished. If you want to find out what the end of antiquity felt like for those living through it, you can't only look at cities. You have to look at the countryside, too. So instead of focusing on urbanization alone, then, I propose we use broader patterns as indices of change. So for example, population levels. Are there fewer people overall? If so, is this due to higher mortality rates, lower birth rates, migration, or some combination of these factors? Are both city and countryside affected equally? What about settlement patterns? Are fewer people living in cities and more people living in the countryside? Do the relative proportions of each settlement type change? Economic networks. Are the same goods being produced and exchanged and at the same scale? Subsistence strategies. Are people producing and eating the same types of food? What about material standards of living? What types of property do people possess? And of what quality are these possessions? Finally, environmental conditions, both natural and man-made. Is the climate more or less favorable to agriculture? How widespread and problematic is erosion? Evidence for, evidence for these patterns cannot be gathered from urban excavation and the written record alone. Instead, we have to look beyond the city to the countryside and reconstruct these patterns using the relatively new, in Turkey that is, methods of regional survey and environmental archaeology and environmental science. So in my broader research, I aim to do this by analyzing results of regional survey projects and environmental research from several regions. I focus on southern Asia Minor and northwest Syria, highlighted in red, where there's a relatively long history of research and where the Islamic conquest created a fascinating tripartite zone graduated along either time, side of the Syro-Anatolian uh, frontier along the Taurus Mountains. I also look at research projects from Central and Western Asia Minor as comparative case studies highlighted in yellow. Today, of course, I won't be looking at all of these issues or regions, but I'm going to focus on some results from Southwest Asia Minor, the area shown in slightly darker red as an example of this kind of so survey is commonly conducted in Turkey now, but it is important to emphasize that the kind of intensive off-site survey, that is full coverage or landscape survey, commonly carried out in places like Greece or Italy, is only rarely conducted in Turkey. Instead, survey projects in Turkey have primarily been intensive site surveys, that is they are aimed at retrieving locations of concentrated human activity like a settlement, a tomb, a quarry, rather than reconstructing a continuous landscape of human activity. In general, these regional survey projects investigate architectural remains and artifacts, usually pottery, scattered across the ground surface of a defined region, usually oriented around a known ancient site. In some cases, architectural remains can be dated by inscriptions or by style, but usually it is difficult or impossible to tell based on architectural remains alone precisely when a settlement was occupied, for example, or for how long an olive oil press was used. So to date and define ancient activities more precisely, survey projects collect pottery at various locations in the region of interest and offer conclusions based on pottery chronologies and distribution networks that have been reconstructed using data from all across the Mediterranean. For late antiquity and the early Byzantine period, However, pottery chronologies and networks of production and distribution are not as well established as they are for other periods. <coughs> this is very frustrating, but also very exciting, because new pottery studies 
of this material have recently been flourishing in order to understand this period in more detail. I will discuss an example of this in a bit. As for environmental research, data can come from a number of sources, some of which you see here, which provide information about the vegetation of the ancient landscape, about changes in climate over time, such as variations in temperature or precipitation, about human use of natural resources, such as what plants and animals people ate, and about changes in sedimentation, such as the rate of erosion over time. So as an example of how these strands of evidence might start to come together to form a meaningful picture, let's focus in on that one area I mentioned earlier, Southwest Asia Minor, um, where I've highlighted three sites. Um, so we'll be looking at the region encompassing Northern Lycia and Southern Pisidia here in Southwest Asia Minor. Regional surveys and environmental research in these territories surrounding the Greco-Roman towns of Kayanei, Balbora, and Lycia, you see those labeled, as well as Sagalassos in Pisidia, excuse me, in Pisidia, can tell us something about these broad patterns of change I mentioned. Most of this is a mountainous inland region, which, although remote compared to the better connected coastal areas, nevertheless supported towns and villages that imported and exported goods and commodities in late antiquity. The town of Sagalassos, for example, whose theater you see here, produced pottery that was exported across Asia Minor, and in turn brought in goods from outside. So these maps of sites and pottery counts from the survey around the ancient town of Balbora that I'm showing here demonstrate the kind of results these survey projects provide. Now you have to forgive me for making these so small, but I wanted to place all three together to better display changes over time. Broadly speaking, you'll notice if you have good eyes, an overall drop in the number of settlements and other sites, such as tombs and funerary altars, over time, as well as in the number of pottery shirts collected from each site, indicated by the size of those circles. This is not a simple linear decrease in site numbers, because in fact, some settlements are actually reoccupied or even newly founded in the sixth and seventh centuries, so towards the end or the later parts of this um, history settlement history, contrary to the overarching trend of decline. You'll no doubt have noticed some problems with these results. One is the potentially artificial nature of these time units according to which the results are divided. These time periods are determined based on the dating of pottery collected in the region, which means that if surveyors find pottery shirts they don't recognize, then ancient occupation and activity evidenced by that pottery just goes unreported. This is especially problematic, as I said, for pottery of the early Byzantine period, since much of it has not been well studied and has therefore been often ignored, meaning that the Byzantine period activity to which it should testify is also ignored and underrepresented. Unfortunately, this, this problematic situation is improving. Another problem for this survey is the very low shirt counts, that is, essentially small sample size for most of the shirt scatters to find the sites here and settlements. What does it really mean, for example, if the number of shirts at a site for each period of occupation changes from one to three to eight? The problem is uh, partly avoided by looking at shirt counts in aggregate only in order to find kind of overarching trends, and I'll explain that shortly. For most other survey projects, including the other two I'll be talking about um, together, this problem is not so um, important. So to take this, excuse me, consider together these three surveys incorporate evidence from both towns and the countryside surrounding them, which is our goal. They reveal several, several overall trends for the time period of interest to us, especially these key centuries at the end of late antiquity, the sixth, seventh, and eighth. Important in all three areas, there's a drop in the number of occupied sites in the entire survey area over time, as we saw in the evidence from Balbora. There's also an increasing preference for living in hamlets or villages of, say, seven to 15 households, rather than living in single household farmsteads. In fact, these single family or single household farmsteads virtually cease to exist in many of these regions. Third, the main urban center in each area becomes depopulated so that it begins to look a lot more like a village than like a town or city. There's also a shift in activity from the main city to the countryside, 
Around Balbora, for instance, this shows up as a flip in the proportion of pottery from the city versus the countryside. That is, where in each century, from the second century BCE to the fifth century CE, the total pottery shirt count from the city was greater than that of the countryside, this long-standing rule flips in the sixth century. So that, so that in the sixth, seventh, and eighth century, it is the total shirt count from the countryside that was greater. Beginning in the sixth century, there's also an increase in the proportion of food preparation vessels, mostly cooking pots, kind of similar to the one shown here, and most produced locally, close to home. And there's an increase in the proportion of these type of food preparation vessels over tablewares, that is, dishes, bowls, with a red slip, um, which were usually imported. This happens in both the city and countryside, but especially in the countryside. A final trend, beginning in the seventh century, is the new predominance of a red slip tableware called late Roman D ware. And I've given you a, a profile drawing and an image of a shirt on the lower right. Over other red slip tablewares from North Africa and Western Turkey, which had previously predominated. So what does this all mean? Well, for one thing, the overall population in these regions does seem to have gotten smaller in this period. People were not simply moving out of towns and into the countryside. We're drawing together into more densely settled villages. <coughs> if that were the case, we would see more evidence of occupation in the countryside, rather than a drop in site numbers and site sizes apparent from the survey data. Another important conclusion can be drawn from the flip in pottery predominance from city to countryside which indicates a shift in investment or a kind of degree of equalizing between urban and rural settlements, as people increasingly chose to live in hamlets and villages rather than either isolated farmsteads or large towns. As the settlement hierarchy of the Roman period breaks down in this way, the most common form of settlement was now the village or hamlet. These were self-sufficient communities, mobile, politically and economically flexible, and adapted in the face of changing circumstances. Most of the pottery used by people living in these areas was now locally or regionally made and distributed as those large, long-distance, interregional exchange networks I talked about before seem to have begun to shut down or contract it. New types of handmade food preparation vessels, such as cooking pots, appear, used at the same time as other wheel-made types. So the introduction of these handmade ones is something new. In some places, the pottery assemblages are dominated by these cooking wares as the kinds of table wares, those dishes and bowls, that had characterized earlier centuries virtually disappear. The disappearance of these table wares could indicate changing dining practices, foods, or access to imports. A major development in understanding this time period has been a recent flourishing, as I briefly mentioned, of ceramic studies aimed at understanding these locally and regionally made and circulated pottery types, which until now have been largely, excuse me, largely neglected since they flew below the radar, so to speak, of archaeologists trained mostly in the recognition of better known pottery types that were exchanged interregionally all across the Mediterranean. When tablewares, so those dishes and bowls, are found, they are no longer imported from North Africa or Western Turkey as they have been previously. Instead, they're either not slip, that is, plain, and I, there are some drawings on the left, or if they are slipped, they are of that late Roman D type that I mentioned earlier, and there are some drawings of that on the right. Late Roman D ware became predominant not only in the survey areas I've been talking about, but also at sites across the eastern Mediterranean of pottery and distribution. This ware is traditionally assumed to have been produced primarily on Cyprus because it was found first there and in abundance. However, the first and only actual production site, so real kilns, for this tableware was just recently found near the ancient site of Pednelisos, here in southern Pisidia. This tableware was also originally thought to have gone out of production in the seventh century based precisely on the assumption that the Persian and Arab conquests of portions of the Eastern Mediterranean, um, Syria and Palestine in particular, would necessarily have ended the production of a, an overseas circulation of these pottery types in the Roman tradition as part of a general kind of collapse of political, economic, and social structures. However, new research on this type tableware and on other, other pottery types 
has shown that this was not at all the case. Instead, they continued to be produced and distributed throughout the Eastern Mediterranean through the 7th and 8th and perhaps as late as the 9th century. What is important about the kilns here at Pednelli Sos for the study of late antique settlement and economic dynamics is the picture they provide of clustered rural industries operating within a regional network, one which incorporated both inland routes that would have been vital to a relatively isolated place like Balbora, for example, that could also stretch over longer distances and overseas. We must imagine these regional exchange networks operating beyond 700 CE, this traditional cutoff date, through the 8th century and possibly even into the 9th. So there are two ways of looking at this development. The glass half empty perspective is that regional networks like this one became visible only because those long distance interregional networks of bulk exchange had ruptured and disappeared, resulting in the world that was less complex, less connected, less vibrant, that is, a real dark age. Someone who sees the glass half full, however, might argue that far from catastrophic decline and social collapse, these regional networks demonstrate continued vitality, and we should imagine not only pottery, but other goods and agricultural products, as well as people continuing to circulate throughout the Eastern Mediterranean and beyond in these centuries. Not so dark after all. Now let's look at some environmental research from these regions and see how they <coughs> might relate to these developments. <coughs> So two broad pa patterns in climate change for this period in the Mediterranean have been identified based on a combination of multiple forms of evidence from written sources to sunspots and oxygen isotopes. One is the so-called Roman climatic optimum from about 100 BCE to 200 CE, characterized by a stable and in some regions a warmer climate favorable to intensive agriculture. The second is a period of climate instability from about 400 to 600 CD, characterized by volcanic eruptions, cooling, aridity, drought, famine, and plague. Another important overarching pattern in landscape studies, specifically for Asia Minor, has been detected in sediment cores obtained since the 1970s from lakes, marshes throughout Turkey. An important pattern consistently appears in the pollen sequences extracted from each of these cores. It is characterized by the presence of cultivated trees such as olive, walnut, chestnut, as well as grape. This pattern was first identified in the pollen diagram from Lake Beşehir in southwest Turkey, and therefore has been named the Beşehir occupation phase, or the BO phase, which is what I'll refer to it as. The fossilized pollen in each layer of sediment is analyzed and plotted on the diagram to show changes in amounts over time, from the oldest layers at the bottom to the most recent layers at the top. In pollen diagrams like this one, the BO phase shows up like a big lie on the lie detector test. You can see it there, a bracketed in red. A sharp and long-lasting spike in the percentage values of cultivated plants like olive and grape, of weeds that thrive on soils disturbed by agriculture, and the grasses well suited for pasturage or animal herding. These species constitute a lineup of usual suspects. They are the primary and secondary indicators of intensive agropastoral activity conducted in the landscape by its human occupants. Though the BO phase has been recorded in pretty much every core taken in Turkey, its start and end dates are not the same at every site, as shown in this table. Many of these various end dates, which remember indicate an end of intensive agriculture, overlap with that long period of climate instability I mentioned earlier from 400 to 600 CE. It is therefore very tempting to link these pieces of information into a general picture of cause and effect, right? Obviously, this period, this period of deleterious climate events must have forced people to give up intensive farming, right? Well, in fact, no. Or rather, we just don't know. We can see a correlation here, but not necessarily a causation. So should we give up? Of course not. You will remember that the end of this, this BO phase, um, these end dates are asynchronous. They're not all at the same time. And they would therefore seem to indicate that regional, that different regions, excuse me, had different local histories. That is, they were not all affected by climate instability at the same time and in the same way. Nor did the human occupants of each region interact with the land in a 
So let's zoom in on one of these regions around, again, our ancient, the ancient town of San Galasos, which I talked about a bit earlier. Research on a number of sediment cores from various locations within the region, which you see here, around Sagalassos, which is indicated by that red dot, have looked at various environmental data dating to all periods of human presence in the region. Here you see a map of the region marked with some of the main coring sites. They include the marshy Barricade Basin, the wetland of Gravgaz in the middle there, and the seasonal lake of Chanakla all the way to the right. So in this synthetic diagram uh, shows the different types of environmental evidence from two of the sediment cores from Barricade Basin, one of those coring sites. The most important observed human activities here are fire, intensive agriculture, and animal grazing. We see that 400 CE, the horizontal line indicated by the pink arrows, marks the end of the BO phase, that is the end of intensive agriculture, signaled by various indicators. For instance, marked by the green and yellow arrows, an abrupt and large increase in pine forests with oak undergrowth. Pine is a pioneer, pioneer tree of fallow land and thus suggests human abandonment of that land. Second, marked by the red arrow, the disappearance of pollen from cultivated crops and trees, those that I mentioned earlier. And third, marked by the purple arrow, a catastrophic event with massive fires as indicated by a spike in charcoal. After 400 CE, that pink mark, pollen types representing meadow steppe vegetation, um, which may represent an expansion of uh, animal pasturing increase. By focusing in on this smaller, better defined area, we can begin to detect some possible relationships between climate, human activity, and landscape change. Here at Barraquette, the end of intensive agriculture corresponds to a time when the climate actually started to become more humid and better suited for agriculture. Bracketed in blue, you'll see that this period of intensive agriculture um, actually corresponds to two centuries of dryness. Um, the, the bracketed in blue there, um, leading up to this 400 CE mark. In addition, the survey, the, the field survey evidence from Barraquette indicates that this val valley was not abandoned time by its human occupants. Therefore, it seems that inhabitants made an active decision to move along the spectrum of agro-pastoralism from more agriculture to more stock raising. This does not mean that they stopped growing crops altogether. The story becomes a bit more complicated when we look at those other valleys in the region where similar data have been collected. The end of intensive agriculture here at Barricade Basin around 400 CE um, which is actually, according to uh, more recent research, probably at least a half century earlier than that, um, is earlier than other areas in southwest Turkey, and even than these other cores taken from the same region, less than 20 kilometers away, particularly in the Alasun and Chanangla Valley over on the right, this area just south of the town of Sagalassos. This may be due in part um, uh, to the fact that Barakat Basin is higher in elevation than other valleys and so will be affected by changes in climate differently. But in these other cores, this BO phase of intensive agriculture lasts 200 years longer than it does in Barakat until the mid 6th century. In this case, it does correspond to a decline in site numbers and probably population as indicated by survey. So this local variation suggests that climate was not the only cause of vegetation change, but that human activity was a major factor as well, if not the major factor. The role of human activity in changing the landscape here is reinforced by the fact that after the end of this phase and the corresponding decline in site numbers, the natural vegetation regenerates, um, as seen in the pollen records, suggesting that human activity in the preceding centuries had significantly altered it by means of clearance, intensive animal grazing, and fire. So the real determining factor of locally specific landscape change seems to have been neither climate nor human activity alone, but rather the interaction between the two. And it can differ even from region or, re region or even valley to valley. And of course, other regions that I haven't talked about today have environmental histories very different from this one at Sabalassos. Although we cannot attribute causation, the fact that the end of intensive agriculture, as indicated by the environmental 
in general correlates in time with a gradual drop in the population, as indicated by survey data, is important because it reinforces the conclusion that the overall population did decline um, in this region at the end of antiquity, rather than simply move from the cities out into the countryside, which was another possibility. And the possibility that pastoralism became more important, especially sheep and goat herding, may provide a clue to the changes in pottery types observed from survey data that I described before, as people began to rely on different foods to a, due to a combination of potentially cultural factors and very practical considerations. So, I've shown you evidence from only one part of the larger area of my interest, that is Asia Minor and Northwest Syria. My goal in doing, in doing so was to demonstrate how we can use the archaeology of the countryside to address this enduring historical questions posed at the beginning of this talk, and to begin to understand the process of the unfolding of Greco-Roman life in new ways by looking at these broad patterns of change rather than at the city alone. Although the changes of the 6th and through 8th centuries did not culminate in absolute social catastrophe, there was a significant decline in the material standards of living and expectations of security that had characterized much of the preceding centuries. The population does seem to have gotten smaller. In some places, such as the frontier zone in Eastern Asia Minor, perhaps as a result of greater mortality or migration away from areas of conflict. In other places, population decline may have been the result of very practical decision making <coughs> to lower birth rates on the part of people living in villages and surviving at a subsistence level. That is, now that previously city-based wealthy landlords and state officials of the Roman period were no longer present in the daily lives of most people, they were no longer expected to create agricultural products in surplus to pay rent or tax. Left to their own devices, as it were, peasants had an incentive to restrict family size, perhaps, since the extra labor required to produce surplus was not needed. This, anyway, is a compelling argument made by Chris Wickham for Western Europe in this time period, and I think, in part, it may apply here as well. Settlement and economic exchange continued, but on a reduced scale, in part as interregional networks dwindled and regional and local ones became more important. Most people had less access to the full range of foods and goods enjoyed by earlier generations. The end of antiquity also witnessed an equalization between town and village and the abandonment of single household farmsteads. The villages that came to predominate were more self-sufficient than farmsteads and more easily adaptable than cities to the complex array of challenges that inhabitants faced in this time period. This does not mean that all cities got smaller. Indeed, many remained important centers of administrative, ecclesiastical, or military activity where the wealthy elite continued to flock and exercise power. These changes in population dynamics, settlement patterns, and exchange networks, as well as resulting changes in lifestyle and culture, should be viewed in the context, I think, of a social structural reconfiguration in response to altered circumstances. From this perspective, it is this very ability to adapt that suggests that complex society was maintained through late antiquity and the early Byzantine period rather than wholly dismantled. And focusing on only one region today, I've done you somewhat of a disservice because I think it is actually more interesting to move beyond this debate over whether or not these changes qualify as social collapse and to focus instead on understanding the variety of responses that played out within each community. At this lo very local level, level, systemic collapse was not a given, nor were the effects of these challenges entirely predictable. My interest, therefore, lies in teasing out the rich and varied storylines embedded in this overarching narrative of collapse and configuration. So the next step in my research is to zoom in on this local
survey results do do things a little bit differently. Mostly it is it is it is pretty basic in terms of number of shirts and weights. And so they're looking both um, at changes over time for each site and then an aggregate to comparing city and countryside, for instance. Um, um, and and it's and and for the most part they're not taking samples of all the pottery collected. They are just using this kind of the rough raw numbers. You know, that could actually be something that I could do across the board with all of these surveys, um, which is a which I think would make these a bit more robust, the data more robust. Yeah. Is that some, is that something that you have been doing and found I you know writing grants as well. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. The the difficulty with this is that you know I'm I'm and this is a problem whenever you're comparing published results of other people's projects, and you know, dozens of them is this very problem. And um, that's something that I have to be more systematic about, definitely. Yeah, yeah I found it very interesting because well, I haven't worked in Turkey, but um, I have conducted uh, a survey in particular uh, which covered the same period pretty much mm -hmm. on the outskirts of a major city, the site of, of Corium. And um, we had material from from this period. Um, you've been talking about the seventh century. I mean, for example, the first Arab raid on Cyprus was 647, mm -hmm. which was a major disruption. We don't see it in the archaeology, we just hear about it in the sources. Mm -hmm. Now, in Turkey, it did were, were the uh, Islamic or Muslim in, uh, incursions that far up to where you were working. Yes. When did they get there? In the later seventh, and then the beginning so of the eighth. So roughly the same mm -hmm. time. Mm -hmm. <coughs> and before that, there were there were Persian incursions all the way to the Western Asia Minor. And sacking of Sardis, for instance, there's well documented you know, evidence of that conflict. And that's one of this one of these major theories that all of this kind of collapse and these changes were because of these recurring era of raids, even just the threat of, you know, of, of violence, the theory goes, would be enough to make people start to change their settlement habits. And I'm sorry, I cut you off, though. I'm sorry. No, no, but uh, I, I, I agree with you. I mean, these raids affected the towns. We know about that right. in Cyprus again. Mm -hmm. they, they besieged them and they told the people to give all their um, mm -hmm. The, the, the valuables to them, and then let them go. We don't know what happened to them afterwards. But the people of the countryside weren't very affected, and this is what you're you're getting really. That the peasants uh, lived on, uh, particularly in isolated areas. But I was interested to hear that you said you're not getting individual farmsteads anymore. Right. Um, the, the latifundia of the Roman period disappear. And, right, and in Asia Minor, there wasn't, a, there weren't as many of those. There was a, there was, and in the, in other parts of the Eastern <coughs> Empire, um, there was a longer history of, of individual um, um, kind of peasant proprietors owning their own small-scale farms rather than some of these huge estates. That would be, for example, around a city like Antioch, and certainly in the West. But I think that this pattern of villages. That, that gets even stronger in this period was in existence in the, in the preceding Roman period as well. You know, you asked about whether um, you see collapse or resilience. Mm -hmm. Are you, I mean, if I had to talk about it, are you using a resilience theory? Is that something that interests you? Well, I mean, I, you know, it's tough because from this, so from this kind of a, a classical archaeological perspective, um, those who view this time period from that perspective all, not almost necessarily see this as collapse, right? Because we don't have the same kind of pottery, we don't have the same. Um, so, so I think it's good to to think of it in that way. I guess I'm I guess I'm beginning to think about it in a more, um, uh, you know, just a, how can we kind of. How can we see it from another perspective without those judgments of this of the classical period? Um, so maybe not formally, 
another we're kind of a decisive moment in the seventh century, after which we have two centuries of darkness and only then there's a Byzantine um, resurgence in the ninth century. And I think part of that it was from this reliance on looking only at cities, only at more monumental classical architecture, essentially, as, as our evidence. Um, so yeah, so I, I mean, essentially, I think that during this period that's been thought of as a dark age, actually there was this basic, um, 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 you know, village-based peasant society that persisted. And then, you know, that's kind of the, the basis of population and generation in the future and in that ninth century. So we see cultural continuity in any form and in traditions that uh, would have carried people from for during your period and then afterwards. I would suggest that it wasn't the collapses and the disappearance of something, but even if it's scaled down and something is preserved And argument yeah, that yeah. it wasn't collapsed per se, but rather it was a cycle. Right, right. I mean, there are new, you know, new pottery types, glazed pottery types. Um, there is still a kind of basic, uh, um, you know, there, there are mostly from this period we have texts as, as evidence of, of agricultural practices that are some that are in some cases similar. Um, there seems also to be this greater reliance on pastoralism. Um, also, you know, in terms of the uh, um, kind of history of migration in this area, other um, types of people move in for whom, you know, or who essentially nomadic tribes who are, who are carrying a very different package with them. Um, yeah, but it's a real thank you. Yeah. Can you see patterns in something like religious remains, uh, churches and cities being abandoned? Uh, monasteries either established or just abandoned uh, what's going on in the villages and is, is it possible actually to make a story out of it? Well definitely church construction late, you know, an explosion of church construction, even some of these small villages of you know twenty or fewer houses will have two churches. Um, uh, um, and I think for the most part uh, monasteries are remain active. Um, but those, some, some of those, um, you know, some of the, the churches are, in addition to the, to the towns in general in which they're embedded, especially on this kind of more city level, village level, they too are out of use. Um, yeah. But. When you were talking about the period after 400, CE, when when uh, there's environmental evidence for a decrease in the amount of agriculture and you've, in this one valley, mm -hmm. and you've suggested that that there might have been a shift in the balance between agriculture and pastoralism with an increase in in, in pastoralism. Um, I, I wonder if you thought it or if you have an opinion on on how much the just simply the methodology of settlement survey that's so focused on on um, sedentary agriculturalists, essentially, that make and break a lot of pottery. Yeah. Um, it, how, how putting a population of low ceramic using, uh, highly mobile pastoralists, what that, what that might do to the overall population level. Of and our ability to retrieve, you know, retrieve it, to see it in the, in the countryside. Um, for, for that instance, around 400 CE, specifically in the region around Sagalasso, there isn't any indication from any source that you do have a new population moving in. The sites that were previously occupied continue to be occupied in much the same way. Um, there are some differences in, in pottery types from that were previously, it seems like the residents right there had gotten most of their pottery from the town, produced from the town of Sagalasso, and then at that 400 mark, um, they become most pottery comes from elsewhere. So there may be a difference, there may be a change in the relationship between those towns in that valley and, and, the, and the major town in the region, Sagalasos itself. I mean, something is something is as um, basic as, well, they decided that this area, since it was in ho a higher altitude area, if the climate did change a little bit, that made it less um, appropriate for olives, for growing, you know, olive oil or wine, as opposed to those lower valleys where that could still, you know, 
those could still be the main production areas for the town of Cybalassos and elsewhere, that maybe they thought, okay, well, now it would be better, be more profitable, it would be better for us to raise animals instead and, and produce animal products as opposed to olive oil and wine, which we had previously. So I think it's the same people. I don't think there's new, I don't think that's suddenly become nomadic. But, but right, but what if a significant portion of the population just moves around with, right. with the herd? So you're raising the, yeah. the overall level of population without yeah. necessarily growing the size of, of sedentary communities. Yeah. I guess that's what I mean. Right. Because there's, there's a rich ethnographic literature on yeah. Right, and the kind of survey that most of these are is it, not it's not very well placed to pick up that on that kind of on that kind of um, activity. Well, um, um, do you know the book by Peter Tonneman uh, about men the values? No. That was a city published. I can also show them article because he studies that you are very big period of mm -hmm. almost thousand year. Because he wanted to see uh, the Shinati side because of the Myanmar the history. Uh, and we don't have big cities. No, but yes, but not exactly. And we have documentation. And his conclusion is remarkable and a bit at all at all your because according to him there were no many magicians. Really? Especially uh, the population because the number and the sizes of the parcels cultivated, mm -hmm. even, even the same as during the crisis of the 6th, 7th century. Mm -hmm. uh, and uh, from this point of view, your uh, conclusions for this area, can this be expanded to other areas, which you might or not? Well, how did he, how did he calculate land, the size of the land parcels? Mm -hmm. How did he do that? The, what, what was he using? Did you say that he was looking at the size of the land, parcels of land? Yes, but you just don't want to not archaeology, but rather rather uh, landscape okay. approach. Yes, which is why. And uh, from this point of view, it was uh, interesting because um, uh, some other archaeologists say that say uh, in the middle, uh, in the middle, present time period, the set of uh, Ishman becomes empty. Mm. We have them from in Cambodia. Yeah. 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 Right. Well, I think that's why it is important to break it down into into. The Region. Somewhere like Cappadocia, the center, I think there is compelling evidence for more abandonment. There's even, there's even environmental evidence also. Um, um, so, right, so I don't think that our aim should be to create a, a narrative to explain that everything has to fit together. Um, so so I, I, wouldn't, I wouldn't struggle to, to think that, I, that each region has to have the same um, you know, history. Um, and I think Cappadocia is actually a, a unique, you know, it's right there on the frontier and it had this kind of um, interesting system in the Roman period of, of those big land parcels, some of them owned by the empire. Um, so it's, I think it's different from this kind of region. But looking at the two together is, is, is interesting. You mentioned climate change, didn't you? Uh, uh, much colder climate. When did that start? Uh, so there are these, so yeah, let me, hold on. Just after the, this is this very, the optimum, right? with, so this is this interesting project that, that is actually led in part by a historian, Michael McCormick, um, and with the desire to combine written sources with all these other different kind of proxy indicators of environmental change for all of, um, Europe, he's not, they're not singling out Eastern Mediterranean or when it's, it's mostly the Mediterranean, it's, uh, Mediterranean basin in Europe. So yeah, so these are these two, two of these, you know, they, they pinpoint a number of what they see as changes, um, and these are two of them. And uh, in which, which were you, you were talking no, about Well, the, the instability, instability, because if suddenly the climate got much colder, I mean, you mentioned olive oil, Olive trees can't survive if they have more than, it's about 30 days frost a year. Mm -hmm. If you go to Mediterranean uh, France and Italy, you see that they go up the slopes and then they stop dead because it's too cold. And if a lot of olive oil had been produced in, in Cappadocia, for example, in, in Turkey in a certain period, 
the spine, if it suddenly got much colder, right. that would uh, mean tremendous changes in the agricultural uh, production. Mm -hmm. uh, and that would push towards herding, because the herders mm -hmm. would be okay, but the agriculturalists would suffer. Right, and that's one, you know, that's one reason, but that, that's one way that may um, um, explain why the bear kept that one base and that is higher in altitude than the rest of the territory around Sagalassos does seem to, to abandon agriculture, or at least scale down things like olive oil um, production um, at this period at 400, whereas the other regions don't, because maybe they're low enough in altitude that they're not forced, their hands are forced in that same way. But in a, on a kind of large scale, if you look at all of the, all of the, um, the way that the, the, the Beshiga occupation phase shows up kind of generally in Turkey, it's not at that early end, it's more towards the 600, 700, And it's tough because you know this is a this is a kind of synthetic um, um, approach, and 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 it's hard to know for any one region that you're looking at how exactly this can be applied to it. No, it's a start. It's a start, it's exactly. Start. Of course, of course. <laughs> well, I may say, you know, survey in Turkey is quite a new, and it's a yes. huge country too, mm -hmm. uh, and it's it's quite a new phenomenon, mm -hmm. and. Uh, uh, 30 years ago, but n none was being mm -hmm. done in Turkey. So, uh, and and they're increasingly, you know, true <coughs> intensive off-site full coverage surveys are being done. So, and I think it will only expand. And you know, it may completely overturn anything that I've said, but that's fine. I'd be happy if that would happen. And 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 as they hopefully become more kind of standardized and. Well, it's difficult to get permits to dig in Turkey, mm -hmm. but you can get permits to survey, so, yeah, which is great. Yeah. Uh, I mean, I lot, that's why lots yeah. of people, and in Greece, lots of people are doing survey work now. Frankly, it's more important than excavating. You're not biased or anything. <laughs> <laughs> no, we've done a lot of excavating there. You know, we don't need that many more digs. All right, well, thank you very much. There will be a reception in uh, across the way, across the way, in uh, Arts and Science 2343. Okay. Well, yeah.